It's a rainy day in April, April 13th, 2011. We came to Keysville to find out a little bit more about the Northern New York American Canadian Geological Society. <laughs> Can't we shorten that to Clinton County? We have talked about it, and Julie's, <laughs> Julie Dowd, our librarian, certainly has been talking about us as the Clinton County Genealogical Society, and that's fair. Um, well, it, it took me six months to remember it, so I'm going to call it by the long name forever <laughs> and ever. Anastasia Pratt, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? President of this austere group, which we've talked about lots of times on television, mm -hmm. and even more often to our friends who need some information about genealogy and other subject matter. This, to let people know why we're here, is because this is a new venue for you. You were forced to leave the Keysville Civic Center, that wonderful old brick school building, uh, a couple of months ago? It was, yes, um, I think the final notice came that we had to be out by September 1st. September 1st. So we were out of the Civic Center, which is unfortunate because it's a beautiful building that... I love that you know, building. Um, if the walls could talk and the floors creak and the stairways and oh my goodness, yeah. come on. Yeah, I really, really hope that um, the building will get reused and, and have a new, new life that'll take care of that beautiful well, historic let's, structure. Let's explain the process. Why? did you have to leave? What are they doing? <laughs> is, it, is it political? Is it, what um, is it? Well, it, it's political. I don't know all of the ins and outs, but I do know that the mayor of Keysville wanted to remove the, the village offices to a new location and was concerned about some structural issues. Um, they're structural issues that I don't necessarily think exist, but, um, but certainly the board of Keysville decided that they did, and they moved their offices, and then um, asked everybody else to leave so that they could close the building entirely. Now, didn't they, have, they had a senior center there too, didn't they? They had a senior center. They had um, storage space for a food shelf. It was an emergency shelter for people in Keysville. I think the only one in Keysville. Um, there were Girl Scout troops. There was an architect. There were some doctor's offices. Um, I, so it was an interesting like decision. Like I said, I had been in that building, had been to court there with various clients when I was a victim's advocate. I'd been to your organization upstairs and, and Calvin and I always got immersed in it because yes. we just had so much fun. So you had to search. You're like the Christmas Bureau when they get kicked out <laughs> of their place every year. How did you find 15 Vine Street? Oh my goodness, well it was it was a very long effort. Um, and I should have said the other group that was in the, the Civic Center that's no longer there is Anderson Falls Heritage Society, of which course. had the beautiful library. Um, but we sort of joined forces to look for a, a new spot. And we wrote to everybody we thought might be able to help. We did appeals by phone, by email, um, and just talked to everybody we could. And one day we got a phone call from Barbara Davison, who owns this building, and said, Barbara said, I love Keysville. I, I want Anderson Falls to stay in Keysville. I want the Genealogy Society to stay in Keysville. And I have this building that I'm not using. Why don't you come look at it? And so it was, it was wonderful. It was just a really wonderful phone call. So we all came, members of Anderson Falls and members of the Genealogy Society, and we looked around and realized it wasn't large enough for both of us, um, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. probably not large enough for Anderson Falls collection. The world is barely large enough for me and anybody else because of my <laughs> great size. But anyway. <laughs> so we decided collectively that this um, would make sense for the Genealogy Society because it's also not large enough for Anderson Falls collection. And our first our first goal would have actually been to have Anderson Falls here if it was large enough, because that society is dedicated truly to the history of this place, um, whereas we could maybe find other options. Um, but since it wasn't, we're delighted to be here, and I think that our librarian, Julie Dowd, and her, her crew, um, including Dick Lynch, who's done just a huge amount of work, and Teresa Whitaker, who's also done a lot of work, um, they've made it look very, very nice. It's it's a pretty large space, but you have a lot of stuff. I was always impressed <laughs> with all the stuff you had collected in the other yeah, location. We do have a lot of stuff, and really, um, this process of putting things on the shelves hasn't asked us or hasn't required us to get rid of a lot of that stuff. We've weeded through the collection. Um, duplicates are definitely not going to be here <laughs> any longer. Um, and, and there's some things that no one uses. Uh, those things will probably not be here any longer as well. 
but everything that's essential, everything that's really fundamental to genealogy research is still here, and we still have space to add some new things that are essential for genealogy research. Well, let's just talk a little bit about the history of this building. When Calvin and I drove up, we almost drove by because it's not very attractive from the outside. Yeah. Um, that's all gonna change, but what was this building before? Immediately before we moved in, it was a medical record storage facility. That's oh. Barbara's company. And so it was very lucky for us because the, the building has been treated in such a way to make it ideal for document storage um, in terms of insulation, in terms of fire retardant materials. Um, it's, really, it's really ideal for that. But prior to that, it was actually a restaurant that I'm told was called oh, Frenchies. Come on, who, who remember? You don't even remember that, Richard. Oh yeah, people raising their hands, <laughs> like we're taking a survey of who remembers Frenchies, huh? <laughs> I certainly don't. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, you, but you are planning to do a lot of work out front. I know you're, you're yes. replacing the ramp. We're replacing the handicapped access ramp, um, making it better, stronger, and a new formulation that'll leave more room in the parking lot for, for people to park. Um, and we also eventually, though it'll be, I'm sure, a season-long project, we'll scrape down and paint the exterior. Yeah, but you had to do the parking lot. Well, yeah, we had to take the ramp down initially because the parking lot was going to be repaved. Um, so we had some volunteers. My dad actually was one of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I know how and that my works. nephews and nieces. And yeah. <laughs> um, we took down that ramp so that the parking lot could be paved, which turned out to be very lucky because we also had to do some work digging up pipes and, and getting the water situated. Um, so now that that's all taken care of, what we will do is, is put the ramp back up and make it look as pretty outside as it does inside. Was it a huge job to get this this space ready? I, no. Uh, well, I mean, yes and no. Initially, no. Um, Barbara and her crew moved out all of their stuff from, from the space, and then we just lugged things in, and um, we hired a mover to do that, and we had a lot of people who volunteered. And um, Did you have to do the painting and things? Or no? no, that was all done. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, no, that was set. So it was ready to move in. We just had to organize. And then it's been stages of work since September to get it looking the way it does now. Initially, the first stage was just putting the shelves around. And it was kind of one of those crazy days where, as I said, my dad was working on taking off down the ramp outside. And my nieces and my mom and I were inside. And what we were doing literally, my sister too, we were literally moving objects from one space to another so we could put something where it belonged and then moving the first thing back. So it was kind of that crazy moving. And then once the shelves were around, then it was, it was time to sort of step back. And that's when Julie and Dick and Teresa and other volunteers came in and really made sure that the books were in order the way they were supposed to. That job was huge. Um, those folks have spent you know, all winter coming at least once a week, spending several hours in a very cold building, because it's not warm yet, um, really doing just huge amounts of work, taking the books out, repairing books that needed repairing, putting them on the shelves where they needed to be, and then organizing the shelves in a way that makes sense for actual research. We're going to spend a lot of time before we're finished today explaining what your organization does for the umpteenth time for people who don't know. So many people now are, it seems sudden, but it's not really sudden. Mm -hmm. They're paying attention to their heritage. Yes. Because we're, you know, we're undergo undergoing a, a, an awful lot of celebrations and commemorations in our country. We're working on the 150th anniversary of the Civil War and the first shots at Sumter have been in the news this past week. There were so many things that happened on that date mm -hmm. yesterday, including the death of FDR, which I remembered so much on the radio when I was eight years old. But, uh, you know, you'll be involved with some of this anniversary stuff, especially with the Civil War. Yes, um, and that that's a four-year-long commemoration. And we're sort of kicking things off with uh, uh, who are your ancestors and how are they connected to the Civil it's War. It's like the Champlain, you know, it, who it walked in is. those footsteps. <laughs> it is, and I think that... Um, that was a wonderful celebration. I do appreciate this celebration for a different reason, and that's, it's this. Um, 150 years ago is still relatively close. You know, the memories of families are still being passed down in stories that are pretty common. The objects that people own are still present. Um, and it's pretty easy to look backwards, you know, three or four generations and see that involvement in the Civil War either as someone who fought or someone who was left behind or someone whose farm was you know, used to produce 
goods that would be sent immediately to soldiers for their use. Um, so, you know, we're hoping to tell some of those stories. And we're also very excited that our big celebration day, our, our big conference day, um, will also coincide with a grand opening, which will be June 4th, Museum Day. And on that day, we'll start to really showcase those hi histories. And we are so fortunate because to some people 150 years ago is a long, long time. Mm -hmm. But we are fortunate that the age of photography was well established. Yes. And there was a man by the name of Matthew Brady who took lots and lots of photographs. Sure. And I hope, as we've said in recent programs with other people talking about the history of our country, I hope that people will start learning a lot more about the Civil War because here we are and if you don't I heard somebody a commentator say yesterday if you don't know about the Civil War you don't know about the history of America <laughs> no an absolutely pivotal moment in our nation's history and one that we need to be mindful of because it's a history that could come back to haunt us if we don't learn from it yeah 620,000 casualties yeah. it's it boggles the mind, doesn't it? Oh, it does. I think the other part of the statistic is that the combination of American casualties in every war we've had since doesn't equal that number. No, not even close. I know you've been a fist, uh, not a history fan, <laughs> a history fan ever since you were a very small child. Yes. That's in your genes because of your mommy, Gloria, and mm -hmm. many other people whom you grew up around. Absolutely. Uh, you're still currently teaching at the college. I teach at Empire State College, and I'm also the historian for the county. For Clinton County. And so it's kind of a natural progression for you to move into the presidency. It wasn't just, here I am, I'll do it. <laughs> no. I had been on the board for a while beforehand, and my mom, as you said, has been involved for many years. So I kind of grew up with the society in, in some ways. Yeah. So let's pause for a moment, and then we'll just get a little conversation going real profound and deep, okay? Excellent. Okay. Glory is here. Dick yeah. Lynch is here. How are you? I'm right. doing fine, thank you. Yes. You and know which is which based on what I just said, right? Just I wanna, hope. Just want to make sure. Gloria, you're like the original Chicken Little. You're everywhere. I am everywhere. But everywhere <laughs> I go, she's I wasn't about one of the first ones, but I was here. I have no idea how long this society has been in existence. 1983. Can it be true? Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Dick was only seven. Yes. <laughs> he knew that, I right? I picked up on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, 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 for you, was it a big struggle getting it all over here, finding a place? I mean, we've talked to your daughter already. You know. We did the same thing that Anderson Falls is still doing, you know, getting in touch with people, letting people know what we were doing, uh, getting uh, pieces in the paper, and so on and so forth. And we were the lucky ones that were able to get this place. And I won't go into the story again, because Anastasia just told you um, the whole story about this place could have been theirs, but they got too much stuff. <laughs> they can't fit in here. Yeah. So, um, but anyways, we were lucky enough to get it. And the nice thing about this is it's so open. You can see everybody at the same time. You can help everybody. You don't have to go from one room to the other. It's wonderful. It's like being in the public library and meeting all our old friends and exactly, new friends. Exactly, exactly. So, Dick, what was your involvement? Uh, just uh, helping move and set up once we got here. and uh, Which involved picking up and carrying boxes down the other stairs bringing them over here, unloading them, going back for more loads, one right after the other. What did you have, big trucks, or what did you use, Dick? Well, uh, we took a lot in our personal pickups, uh, pickup trucks, um, and it was a lot of hauling. You don't realize how much you have until you start dealing with it. It's uh, quite a task to move this volume of, uh, of heavy books, so it was, uh, plus all the equipment and uh, we tables have a and moving chairs. Man too. And uh, they were hired, uh, we hired a moving company to, uh, to do the heavy stuff. Really? Yeah. Well, that, uh, that's a project all by itself. Yeah, it was cool. So it just doesn't say, uh, you know, you just didn't say one afternoon we're going to 15 Vine Street and, no. and have the first meeting by 7 o'clock that night. <laughs> no. 
It took no. a long time to find a place and then to move in here, but it is fortunate that you were able to find a building at all. We were very and as fortunate. I said before, if somebody wants to drive up here and pay the dues and become a member of this wonderful organization, we'd love to have them. That's right. But, you know, it doesn't look too classy from the outside yet, but that's all going to change. That's going to change. And I suppose you'll be out there with a hammer and a screw gun, right? I plan on it, yes. Yeah. Paintbrush and... The whole nine yards. The whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the place can be spruced up when you get the new yeah. ramp done for the front door. Saturday the ramp is going in so that we can take care of people who are in wheelchairs and can't do the stairs anymore. That's me. Can't do the stairs anymore. We will have the ramp and he's working on it Saturday if the rain, if the rain holds out. And Dick tells me it's going to. <laughs> so anyways, and then our sign will go up. Yeah. We have a sign already made. Oh, I saw a sign in the window. Now, I'm getting pretty old, but I had to adjust my glasses, and when I was driving by, I could see. That's an awful lot to put on one little tiny sign. Yeah. Anyway, it does take a while, and yes. I'm not belittling the place at all. I'm delighted that you're here, and if what Anastasia says is true, this building's going to be standing here long after you, all of us, are dead and gone. Good. And hopefully the library will still be here all this time. I didn't ask, what kind, what kind of heat does this place have? Uh, it has radiant uh, floor heat. Come on. Oil. Um, it had been sitting idle for two years, so uh, it was an adventure getting it all turned back on. Was it really? No broken lines or anything? Uh, there or? was plenty of them, yes, uh, including the main water line, which... Had to, had to be excavated and, You've got and replaced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it was interesting. <laughs> well, you brought in your backhoe, right? No, the village did that. <laughs> Luckily, that's their that. part from outside the building, but uh, um, it all came together pretty good. You mean they didn't have to have heat on when they used it as a medical supply facility or storage place? Mm, I don't believe so. No. Isn't that amazing? Because this building is well insulated and it's well fixed a purpose for records so they didn't have to worry about things like that. It's very, very interesting. I can't, I cannot remember for the life of me when it was a restaurant called Frenchie's. I don't think there's a town in America that didn't have a place called Frenchie's in it at one time or another. Yeah, we'll have to check it out. If they sold Michigan's, well, maybe I've been here. There. <laughs> Huh? They did? Come on, Carol, oh. you know that? <laughs> oh. And Mexican food. And, oh, and Mexican. Mexican food. Mexican food at Frenchies, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Ha, 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 That was an important part of the history, but That's we're right. here now. So, what other roles have you played? You, it sounds to me like you're wearing any hat that somebody leaves on the table, Dick. I don't mind helping out, huh? I did the Quebec section uh, as far as uh, sorting the books, uh, inventorying them, putting them back on the shelves in order, and uh, uh, plus I cleaned the place and straightened a lot of the other sections. So up. were you actually a member of the group before all this, or did they just say, hey, we need a volunteer? Uh, no, I've been a member for quite a few years. Um, this year I, I just joined the board of uh, directors. Well, but, good uh, for you. Um, good for us. <laughs> it's it's always been a an uh, an interest genealogy. So uh, we've been uh, my wife and I have both been over here quite a bit, um, doing our own research. And his wife Lynn does the Palantines. Oh no! Yeah, kidding. she's great at that. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a good mix. She's uh, half Palant, half German uh, ancestry. So her family came in through New York. So. She's got a, a wealth of knowledge about that area. She sure does. I'm certain that many people will be hearing about this wonderful society for the very first time today. Although it's not our fault because we talk about it every chance we get. And as I said earlier when I was talking with your lovely daughter, uh, I talk about it all the time. Yeah. In person and on email. And I tell people who live far away from here, if you don't have a group like this in your town, you better get one started. That's right. Because you get to fill in, it's like making a giant jigsaw puzzle. Exactly. Somebody comes in here and there's a 200 year part of their family that needs that piece in That's place. That's right. And you try to find it for them. And sometimes we're lucky, sometimes we do, but you know, we can't find all the pieces, but we try. Well, the resources are getting better and better and better, not only here, but on the internet and exactly. various, various places. Yep. And I can only, you know, we all speak from personal experience. 
uh, it's an enriching experience to find out who your ancestors were, Dick, right? Well, absolutely. Uh, if you're from this region especially, because uh, it's all so tied to the history of uh, of course uh, of the formation of our country and, and uh, the Canadian uh, aspect of it. It's, uh, uh, it's a real, uh, real interesting adventure. Have you always lived in, in Keysville? Uh, I'm from Plattsburgh. Oh, you live in Plattsburgh now? Uh, I live in Saranac, but I'm from Plattsburgh. Oh, yeah. okay. So, so how did you originally get involved with this group? You just... Uh, well, I knew the founder, uh, Bill Marquis. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I worked with him at the prison. Uh, so we talk a lot up there about genealogy. and uh, He probably put the bug in my ear, hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. As he did a lot of people. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like uh, opening an old trunk up in the attic. You go in there and you find some guy that was your great-grandfather and you may see a picture of him standing there and you say, hey, you know, this guy was my great-grandfather. If you're so lucky, his like name a, was on the, on the picture. Well, if you're, <laughs> you know, how many times do we mention that? And we'll mention it a few times before we leave here, how important it is to identify people in these old photographs. Hmm. Because, uh, you know, I have people every month send me an old album that they found on top of a box of old things on the way to the dump and thought maybe I'd be interested because these people look old yeah. and they have no clue who they are and they're probably their own ancestors. And even if they took a, a, a picture and they only know one person in that whole picture, mark the name of that person down, which one it is, at least it gives us a start. Because other people will come in and say, well, I don't know that one, but I know this one. And before you know it, we finish our jigsaw puzzle. It works. You have to do it while you can. You oh, have yes. to get Grandma there. Not only have her identify the pictures, but get a recorder going and get her life history. Exactly. You know, I've said many times on camera, but my father was a very colorful individual. And before he died, we had him talk for like six hours on cassette tapes. Wow. His whole lifetime history. I, I joke now, and he'd laugh up there somewhere. Maybe that's what killed him. We had him talk for six hours. <laughs> but what a pleasure it was for me, 30 years after he died, to sit down, take those cassette tapes, and transcribe every word, every sound he made for all those hours so that I could read it, hand it to my kids and to their kids and to their kids. Exactly. And to hear that wonderful voice that my father had on those cassette tapes. But it is, it's, it's an enriching experience for a lot of reasons, some of which we may not get into today, but we're going to try, Gloria. Okay. <laughs> but right. it is nice to know. And some people are fortunate to trace their ancestry back many hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. I'm just working on right, right, right now Bigelow family. I had two There's different families. There's a fairly common North Country name. I had two different families, and I said they just have to connect somewhere but I just could not do it. And finally, on Monday afternoon at 3.30, I called Anastasia and I said, guess what, I did it. I was able to put them together. They all belong together. And I love it. And they go back to the 1500s. You know, it's genealogical archaeology, yes, right? Absolutely. And you're over, you never know if that next shovel's full is going to show the bones of your ancestors, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. So exactly. it is difficult sometimes because records were kept in different ways up in Canada. Exactly. Names were altered so much coming across the border. Mm -hmm. That's why it's great to have a, a society such as this. <clears throat> For the people who didn't have their pens going before, I don't know if we'll be able to show a picture of the name of this place on, on television, but we certainly can talk about it. But it's Northern New York, American, Canadian, genealogical society and it covers a lot of ground yes, doesn't it, it does yes we do yeah because we you talk about other other uh, countries and other cities uh, and other locations being melting pots we got the we got the best melting pot of all up here that's right mm -hmm. and you know, we're very lucky and we're very fortunate in the books that we have and a lot of them are from bill marquis when he first started this he donated his books to our society and we have a big selection on Maine, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Unbelievable, the different states that we have. And I know I've missed a lot of them. Vermont, we have a big Vermont section, thanks to our Vermont Society. Um, 
they have been keeping us up with all their new books and every time we get a new book we exchange it and right now we owe them plenty because they've done so much for us that's wonderful to have a guy like this over here who, who, who doesn't mind helping to build a ramp exactly but you have a personal invested interest in this organization dick right oh absolutely uh i i wouldn't have my my history uh together without the resources that are available here. How far back have you gone with your own family? I have most of mine back to France, uh, 1500s. Isn't it wonderful? It's, it's, it uh, is. This is where you start. It's all here. If you can make your connections, uh, you can go back quite easily. Yeah. Well, we, we haven't talked about it yet, but I want to mention it several times. How can people get involved? They, can they just walk in here in a given time and say hello? And Exactly. We're open on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And uh, Wednesdays is from 11 to 10 to 6. 1 to, one? One to, six. Oh, 1 to 6. I'm sorry. Get the experts right. here. 1 to 6 on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. And Saturdays is 11 to 4. Because we just did Saturdays, so I knew that one. And you just walk in the door and tell us that what you're looking for. You're trying to do your genealogy. You don't have to be a member to come in here. You do have to pay a $5 fee for the day researching. And if at the end of the day you decide you want to join, that $5 goes towards your membership. Well, let's talk about membership. Okay. So, how do you become a member? You just come in and tell us you want to become a member or send your information by email or telephone or whatever and we'll send you a form. Membership is $30 for a single member. And for family members, it's uh, $35. And then we have other, other uh, prices for uh, industrial and for um, students, things like this. We have different prices, price ranges. And these people who come here on a regular basis like you guys mm -hmm. are not just interested in their own heritage, but they really enjoy getting into yours and somebody else's. Exactly. I was told this years ago that I should help other people. I said, oh, never. I just want to do my own and get done with it. And here I am doing it for everybody that I can, that I can help. Yeah, I want to tell people why I'm so jealous about this organization. I like all the people here, but I, I like what you stand for. Trying Thank to, you. I mean, you putting those pieces to that puzzle together. It was uh, some time ago. I began an informal search on my mother's side because I knew what had happened. I knew three brothers came from a certain place in France as French Huguenots, why they came over here and where they settled in 1678 in a place that's now called Sleepy Hollow, right, okay. Terrytown. And it was because it was an odd name and it was easy to trace. R-E-Q-U-A is my middle name. So they had, uh, you know, members of the family put it together and we had a tercentennial, a 300th anniversary in 1978 in Terrytown with family members from all over the country, the oldest and the youngest, oh, that's fun. and it was wonderful. And then you, you slog through and try to add little pieces here and there, and then all of a sudden, Julie Dowd is not here today. She's sick. She was going to be here. Oh, but... no. Yeah, I know. It made us feel bad too, but yeah. We'll pause a moment for Julie and hope she feels better. But I hope all so. of a sudden, I get an email from Julie. And this is not a long time ago, several months ago, let's yep. say. And she said, I'm sure, she started off by saying, I'm sure you already have a copy of it. But I ran across this book that was written in the late 1800s about the history of your family. I said, what? <laughs> yeah, right. And it was, I forgot how long it was. Let's say... 69 or 89 pages written by Ariqua, a member of the family, including every ounce of history of that family as far back as he could go then. And it felt like reading the Genesis in the Bible and who begat who begat who yeah, right. all the way oh. down through. And so I immediately, you know, I was vociferous in my gratitude and thanks to Julie, and I sent a copies of it via email to all the members of my family and they were all blown away because yeah. there are people like you who've been researching this family for 50 years and they never knew that book existed. That's right. That's so right. doesn't it please you to do that for somebody? Yes, Absolutely. it does.
Yeah. And you know, that's the same thing with this place. A lot of people didn't know we were here. A lot of people still don't know we were here. We're here. And we, even though we have all kinds of um, advertisements, thanks to you people, we get a lot of advertising. And I hear people say, oh, I saw you on TV last night. So of course, right away, I know where it's from. <laughs> But, you know, even though we have a lot of advertisement out there, there's still a lot of people that don't know about us and that we're willing, we're here, we're willing to help. You know, it's a real adventure just to get on the website. Mm -hmm, it sure really? is. Really? Yeah. Think of all the, all the photographs and videos and wonderful historical information. You can get lost on a nice spring night yeah. with your laptop sitting out on your deck somewhere when the weather gets a little better. But it's a project just to keep that website going, isn't it? Yes, it is. Julie does the website for us, and she does a wonderful job of it. And you know, that's another thing. When people come in here, and they give you a little bit of their family tree, and they'll say, oh, this, I just thought you'd be interested in having it. Of course we're interested. And this big old family, somebody came in to Anastasia's office, Clinton County Historian's office, and said, I thought maybe you'd like these here. It's a big old family. And of course we love it. So I've been working on the Big Lows ever since. And this is where we were able to do so many names, so many places. And they're all local people. We're, we're talking about Peru. We're talking about Shazy, Ellenberg, uh, Schuyler Falls. And you know, all from one, maybe eight to ten pages, this girl brought me in, this lady brought me in. I mean, it's wonderful. But this is what we can probably do for your family. Bring in your, your paper. And if we know of somebody who's working on that family, we'll be glad to tell them. And another thing people say, oh, I've been to your library and you don't have anything for me. You don't know what we've had within the next couple of weeks. We just brought in uh, five or six more family trees this morning. I mean, if people, if you don't keep coming back and keep asking, you're not going to know about it. People who are interested in genealogy are the nicest people. They're magnanimous. By that I mean, if they could help you, they'd love to help you, even if they've never met you before. Exactly. It's exactly. something that must be in your blood. <laughs> and at the end of the day, if you haven't found one of those missing puzzle pieces for somebody, you're going home unhappy. That's right. Right? And we Absolutely. keep looking. And the best part of it is, is some people will say to me, uh, I'm the one that does the memberships. And they'll say, I'm looking for this family. Can you give me any help? Well, I can't come up with an answer in two days, maybe not even two months, but I will keep looking and I will keep trying. And the best part of it is, is a lot of these people will join for a year and then they drop us. But then when I find the information they're looking for, I send them a letter first to the old address, even though they're not members anymore. I send a letter to the old address, say, if you're still here, I have the information you're looking for. And 10 times out of 100, we get back not living at this address, no further address. And here I've got all the information they were looking for, but because I didn't find it within a couple of weeks or so, it was almost like, well, they weren't going to get it. And that doesn't work that way. No. <laughs> We hunt for years to find our, our uh, some of our family lines. So. Exactly. Yeah. And, and like you said, people will come in and like they brought that book in that Julie knew about your family. If they bring in a book or something that we know somebody else is working for, first thing we do is say, hey, guess what? Somebody here is working on the family tree that you're interested in. And people who find out that their ancestors were involved in the political history or the military history or... So, uh, you know, some other facet of life here in the North Country are proud to tell other people about that. Absolutely. Definitely. I spent several hours yesterday on my, on my own couch in my living room talking with a young man who goes to Plattsburgh State, mm -hmm. who loves to write, he's interested in journalism, but he's also interested in ghost stories, and you know I mm -hmm. am as well. Yeah. But the, he was doing a project for school about, about uh, creepy places on the campus. So I was giving him some of my wife's history, going back to the days of Benjamin Vaughn, who was a Revolutionary War hero That's in Vermont right. and helped to build the kid to Lord House, and they found his bones when they built McDonough Hall. Yep, right. Maybe he haunts the place, and, and uh, he married the daughter of the first white woman in Clinton County, yep, that's Alvina right. Averill. But I wouldn't have known that stuff unless I 
got, had met you people years ago and started getting involved with that's it. That's right. That's right. So if, if uh, you know, they say that ignorance is bliss, but it's not always that way. Bliss is these people <laughs> being able to help somebody who comes to them. And, but, but the average person may not know where to start. Right. They may have a computer, and they may get on Ancestry.com or some other place, or they may try to get into some archives in Letterkenny in Northern Ireland like I did, and the door doesn't open unless you, unless you give me your credit card exactly, number. Exactly, exactly. So, you know. And this is something else that we have, too. We also have uh, papers. Again, Julie did these papers up for all the free Internet things that you can get free information from. And I think we're all part of that. We want the free as much as we can. We're willing to pay for some things, uh, but you know, you can't pay for everything. And another thing that our society does is we put out a journal. We used to put out two journals a year. This is our new journal. This is two in one. That's pretty slick. You this know. is from last year's journal. And Anastasia is the one that did this one for us. And Julie, of course, is involved with this. Yes, and um, we have these here uh, are done. Now we're doing them once a year instead of having to bundle them up and mark them and bringing them to the um, the post office to mail it's cheaper for us to do them once a year and get them out in a nicer form book and nice print and everything and it's cheaper and this is what we have to work on right now because of our move we need to get as cheap as we can we have to try to save money so that we can keep this place going and even though we're getting a good deal here you know, we still have a lot of uh, revenue. Uh, our furnace that had to be fixed up and other things that had to be done. That <laughs> he's poor smiling, Dick, he's smiling, Richard. That poor Dick did do. He do, he doesn't get paid for anything he's doing, but he had to get us some people who come in and help and um, at a better price than we would could have anywhere else. So I mean, you know, it's things like this. But this is what we've got to learn is how to save money. And of course, our society also has books available. What's this? What's this? This is our newest about one. about 12 pounds here. It's two books. It's uh, St. Peter's of Plattsburgh. Oh, okay. I can do one at a time. Yep. It's St. Peter's of Plattsburgh, and the books uh, sell for $70 a set, and it's $12 shipping and handling. But if you're local, you can pick them right up here for $70 and save yourself your postage. What's in here? Then this one here is just baptisms, would you believe? You've got to be. This one here is You've deaths and good. marriages. Look at this. Isn't that wonderful? Look at them all. And, and you know, the best part of it is, is we're doing all the area books, and we're trying to get them all done as fast as we can. And Dick Lynch is a big help on this one, too. He's helped us with Danamora, Line Mountain, uh, Standish. Same. St. Peter's Census. St. Peter's Census. And all these books are available right here. Not all of them yet, but we're still working on some. But this is our newest book that's out. That's births. This is marriages and deaths. Marriages and deaths. You notice we didn't get rid of them as fast as we brought them in. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. The, the death records, there was a couple of uh, books that were missing in uh, St. Peter's, and they had no idea where they were for the deaths. So that's why we don't have as close, as many deaths as we probably would have if they had those books. But there's some years missing, and it tells you right here where they are. Now, do you collaborate with any other organizations? Do you work with any other groups? Like you're, let's say somebody's from, uh, I use the word Oshkosh because I love the sound of it, like, okay. Beasley, like Beasleyville. <laughs> but say, let's say you're rel you were brought up in Oshkosh. Do you have a way of coordinating, collaborating with other societies? Not really. Not really. We haven't done this. We've done it with Vermont, uh, and that was because I'm from Vermont, and I knew about the Vermont Society, yeah. and I got an interest in the fact that I've been a member there for years, and we got to talking years ago about how about us giving you what we do with one of our books every time we put one out, and you give us one of yours, and they've gone gung-ho. The bishop has been behind them, gave them permission to... Uh, do all the, the uh, churches there in Vermont, and that's what they're doing little by little, but they're getting it done. And it takes a lot of work. It takes people to go to these places, copy the information, and most places will let you use their copiers, and you know you have to bring your own paper, and we usually pay for an ink uh, for their, uh, their toner, for their one thing. So I mean, it costs us quite a bit to do that much, and the rest of it's all volunteer. People who, who get the information, put it down on a card, 
transcribe it, put it on a card, and then type it into these the the uh, CDs so that we can get them copied. There's a lot of work, and it takes a lot of people behind the scenes, and it's amazing on how many names you find on a book, people who've but done this work. there have to be a lot of other societies like yours around the country, aren't there? There are, and, and every time we get to uh, know about a book that's for sale, if we have the money, we usually buy them. Um, but we, it's nothing that we work together on, mainly because it's they have... a network of... They have, Come on, we got to get that going here. <laughs> they have their, um, well, see, I think they're probably afraid that, you know, if we get in with them, they won't be able to sell the book, and that's not the way it goes. <laughs> Whoever does Come the book on. is the one who does it. Well, yeah. a lot of people are funny about that. They're not as helpful. Well, you're, I know you guys are helpful. You're all helpful. Everybody in this room and lots of people that aren't here, how big is this? society of yours how many members right now would you guess we have about 375 members and the best part of this is since the recession we lost a lot a lot of people couldn't afford to you know join and whatever but you know another thing too is once they get the information they were seeking or they don't think we've got any they don't join again and you know a lot of people say well I don't even live around I couldn't even use your library but you can use us you can use us through the internet Send me an email. Tell me what you're looking for. I'll do my best to try to find it for you. And, well, you know, I know you very no, well, I mean, Gloria. I know all of us well. do. We're all, you know, yeah. we all would really try our best to help you. You don't have to live locally to be able to get help. And for those of you that live out of state or out of town, here's some books. They're available. We, we do not lend them out, but they're available for sale. We have so many wonderful, dedicated people here in the North Country. You know, I'm very proud of this area. Always, and we, Calvin and I on Hometown table, Cable talk about northern New York, rural northern New York, Vermont, uh, and the, the provinces that are, that are close to us in right. Canada, because they're really neat people here. The pace is a little bit different here, but the, you know, the people who are into genealogy, the people who dedicate their lives to be historians for small communities or for yeah. the county, like your daughter over in the corner. This takes a great deal of dedication, but it, there is personal satisfaction in it too. And I, it's and, obvious from both of you people and from everybody else we've talked to. And I think we all agree that if everybody is willing to share what you have with other people, like right now, uh, thanks to Anastasia, I'm able to work on a lot of the family trees there in her office. And then when we finish up a family tree and we make a book out of it, then we're able to give it to the other historians, the Peru historians, the Shazy historians, um, Ellenberg, whoever has a lot of names in this certain book that we're doing, we try to get them a book also. Because we're not going to get anything hoarding these books just to ourselves. But by passing them out to others, and the nice thing about this last family that I was just working on, the people from Ellenburg, the people from Schuyler Falls, people from Shazy um, and um, Peru, all these people will give us everything they have in their office to help make this a book possible. So there is a collaboration between with, with a lot of the other uh, organizations, historians, historians, the historians in the community. Yes, very much so. And we've got we're trying to make it more it's more open and that we share more. It's not like, well, you can come look at my office and see what I know. If I have something for you, I'll be glad to send it to you. You know, uh, what's a couple of copies cost so that we can get more of an information so that no matter where you go in the North Country, you're going to find, especially Clinton County, because that's where I'm allowed to send these books out to Clinton County. You guys are, are great. <laughs> Thank you. It's not that Gloria talks a lot, Dick, but I mean, you're, <laughs> you're, you're over there. You're, you're a man uh, whose deeds speak for themselves. Yeah, we, I don't know what we would have done without him. I really uh, don't. I, what I like about this society is um, I think this area in general is a family-oriented area. Um, and I think we help um, solidify and um, keep the bind uh, between family uh, members by by doing this research. Uh, I know I've attended uh, family reunions in Montreal. Uh, so I, I think it brings, it keeps the families close and I think it brings those that have drifted away back together. It's, it's, 
and a lot a lot of that goes on uh, through the, an organization like this. Exactly. We've said before that Calvin and I find ourselves uh, repeating things that we've said before, but it's very important to let people know and instill in them how, why they should learn about the history of their family and their area. Mm -hmm. It's all tied in together. And how can you possibly know what tomorrow might bring and make a, a judgment on what, what's happening politically and in the world unless you know where you came from? Exactly. Where you personally came from and where your area came from. So history, it is important to at least have a peripheral interest and knowledge in in history. Absolutely. Definitely. You know, and as I said to uh, Anastasia in the beginning, we're entering a, a four-year commemoration and celebration of things that happened in and around the Civil War. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And if you don't understand about what happened during that very volatile time in our nation's history, there's no way you can know what we're doing today. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. So you welcome new members all the time. Love them. We're going to pause for just a moment and carry on this conversation. We might hear, be here next Tuesday. You never know. That's okay. <laughs> Musical chairs. <laughs> How are you, Teresa? I'm fine. Thank you very Teresa much. Teresa Whitaker with no H in the Teresa and no two T's in the... In the Whitaker. In the Correct. Whitaker. <laughs> yes. What? Is, is it an English name? Um, no, actually, my mother thought she was naming me after St. Teresa of Lisieux. Oh, oh, not a bad But St. Teresa of Lisieux actually had the H in it, but she, she didn't know that. <laughs> so Whitaker. Whitaker. My husband actually is from Arizona, but my family is from this area. Oh, wonderful. Yes. So, you know, have you and I met before? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. I heard everybody call you Teresa when I walked in, and you had that wonderful, friendly, <laughs> friendly face like everybody should know you. Well, it's about time then. Yes. <laughs> so what's your involvement with, the, with this association? Well, I am a member of the board, and um, my, my husband actually provided a, a trailer to help the folks move. He couldn't do any of the lifting himself, but he uh, provided trailer to help them load up. Um, I um, took upon myself to uh, organize the New York State books. <laughs> it, it's easy to say in one sentence, but it's, a, it's hard to get all that stuff organized. It, yes, it is, because um, we packed fairly in a hurry, and so many people were packing that we tried to mark book the uh, boxes, but they weren't all marked correctly. Yeah. <laughs> so, and um, that's a big collection to try to organize, and I wanted to get, like, the counties in alphabetical order so they were easier to look through. Um, we have a beautiful, beautiful collection of uh, Catholic church records. Um, we have a few um, of the uh, Protestant records, but uh, Catholics kept the best records and they were more open to us copying them. Sometimes the old priest didn't always spell the names right. Well, and they say, oh, that's not the name of a saint. Let's give you a name of a saint. Exactly. Found it in my own family. Did you really? Have an, have an Aunt Emma, who definitely was Aunt Emma. Her baptismal certificate says Emma. She was always Aunt Emma. She was baptized Mary Josephine. Isn't that yes. beautiful? Yes. That's, that's just a small example of what can happen yes. along the way, right? Yes. Had I not known her birth date and her parents, I would not have known who this Mary Josephine was. So finding genealogy isn't as easy as just looking up a name somewhere in the, in the 16th century. You've got to get to there from here, and sometimes the it's a circuitous path that goes around in circles, and you meet. You must have met yourself coming back several times. Oh, I've met myself, yes. Um, and something really wonderful that has happened to me is that um, I have ancestors who were called La Flemme, and I lost them. I just simply, they were gone. I knew that my great great grandmother had moved to Little Falls. I had no idea where her 11 brothers and sisters were. Come on. Had no idea. Could Just not find gone. them. Yeah. 
and suddenly got an email from a woman in New Hampshire that said, we are cousins. I love it when that <laughs> happens. <laughs> she, is, she is descended from my great-great-grandmother's brother. You know, and in this, um, I have now found at least four of the other children and relatives and ancestors of them. I've talked to I mean, so many genealogists <laughs> to say, I need a little luck today. Because you, you've gone, every place you've gone is a dead end. Yes. And that's why I've, I've said many, my philosophy is we're all connected. Sometimes somebody up there has to pull a string on our behalf because I'm not smart enough to figure out where I'm supposed to be on a given day. So you find a cousin over there and she sends you an email. And well, and not only that, but you were talking about photographs with, um, with Gloria. I had a photograph of the family, which was not yet complete, taken in the late 1800s. She had a photograph taken in the 1900s, in early 1900s, about 1920. And between the two of us, we were able to put a name to everyone in the both photographs. Oh. oh. Yes. Sometimes that makes you sick to your stomach and gives yes. you an awful headache when you try to do that, but you did it. We did it. We did it. It's so important, and I want to mention that again at this point in our interview. If you have old photographs at home in drawers and cubby holes, as my mother called them, Get the family together at your earliest convenience, especially the older members of the family, before they say goodbye, and say, who is this wonderful lady over here in the corner? I called my brother on the telephone a couple of weeks ago, and he lives way down in southwestern Pennsylvania, and I said, you get your fanny up here this summer. I got these photographs, and I've got hundreds and hundreds of photographs that I got from my mother, and between the two of us, we've got to put as many names on them as we can before we say goodbye, because it's terrible when the next generation has no idea, and that's part of it, by not knowing who's in the picture. Well, I, I also um, suggest to every young mother today, when you have a photograph of your child, even a school photograph, date it and name that child on the back of that photograph, because 10 years from now, you're going to say, was that second or third grade? <laughs> Was that Johnny or Billy? <laughs> well, you know, perfect example. Somebody sent me some schoolyard photographs of my little schoolhouse in Messina Center. And, you know, uh, now I can remember most of the people. But who knows in five years whether <laughs> little by little the memory tends to walk away, especially for the names. So put them on. And you know what I love? It just dawned on me. We have an old high chair that some guy made for his little son or daughter in the 1800s and you flip it over and there's a whole legend in pencil on the bottom who made it when it was oh. made who it was made for that's wonderful so if you do that for other generations they'll be thrilled i have a bared clock that was made in plattsburgh and inside it says something like bought march 3rd 1898 five dollars then you have the name of the first guy who repaired the clock same thing with photographs Wonderful. So how did you first get involved with this group and with, uh, with genealogy? Well, I got involved with genealogy because my father was an orphan. He was in an orphanage in Manhattan. And when he was 11 years old, the Catholic brothers that ran the orphanage walked all the way from Manhattan with a group of boys. Come on. And Yes. And my father, at the age of 11, ended up as a farmhand on a farm just outside Keysville. Now we had a where German... You, where you yes. Who was oh. running the ball game back then and made that happen? The, the orphanage burned down. Come on. Yes, and we had, he had no proof of heritage. We had a German surname. I still remember during World War II that we were very restricted because he could not prove his ancestry. This and I was determined to find it. Of course and I, I, I have gone back as far as his grandparents and have trouble getting beyond that because he knew that he only sp spoke German, but actually he lived in Hungary. No, he didn't live in Hungary. I'm going to back up on that. What I found was a ship's manifest. He was born in the United States. He was what would we do without those old ship's manifests, yes. though? And my mother was French-Canadian. She also spoke French as a child. Lost it all. She knew no French when she got older. Um, didn't speak much about her family. 
talked about a few uncles, Uncle Nelson and Uncle Octav, and a little bit about her parents, and I thought that my children needed to know their heritage. And in doing this, I am a person who absolutely hated history in high school. Come hated on! It. Hated it! I never would have guessed that! Hated it! And I never remember being taught anything about Canadian history. Oh, that's kind of silly, isn't it? Isn't that in silly? retrospect. Isn't that silly? Where'd you go to school? Well, actually, I went to uh, Immaculate Conception. Did you? <laughs> Come down here in Keysville, <laughs> and then and then um, and then I, I went to Keys, Keysville High School. But I don't remember us ever studying Canadian history, and I never knew of the plight of the Acadians. And isn't you know, that amazing? And I, I have learned a lot in my search, and I have. Through the books here in the library, I have traced one line back to 1650. That's cool. Yes. Original settlers in Nova Scotia. That's so cool. That is wonderful. So yes. many of the people get involved in this society as board members. Well, I didn't uh, start as a board member. Actually, I saw them online. I oh, saw you the did? yes, oh. I, I saw the, the the site online and I made a phone call. Um, at the time it was uh, Bobby Sam who was the um, president, and I said, how do I join? She said, you come into the library. And that's what I did, and when I saw what was available, now I've been at this for 12 years. Have you really? And I feel like I have just scratched the surface. There's a lot more to learn, and a lot more here well, so, to look So a lot through. of people get involved for, almost, for selfish reasons, because they want to know where they came from. Exactly. Then you get involved and you want to help somebody else and somebody else walks in the door and said I don't know where my grandfather came from mm -hmm. and so you get involved and go down that street. Huh? Yes. Well, we have such wonderful Canadian records, we have such wonderful New York records which involve many many count counties in New York. Um, I was able to trace my first husband's family back to the 1400s using Ulster County books here because they were uh, Dutch reformed. Mm -hmm. No kidding! Yes. Well, you know, there, yeah. there's the old, uh, the old uh, Dutch Reformed Church in Sleepy Hollow, yes. where my ancestors intermingled with the Dutch down there, and my mother was an expert on those, those yeah. so-called Pennsylvania Dutch, where it weren't I, Dutch at all phrases. Yeah. Like, I believe we have some uh, reference to Sleepy Hollow here. I'm pretty wow. sure we do, yes. Well, you look yeah. at those references and you find the name Requa, and you'll know that they were my ancestors. Yeah. Teresa, mm -hmm. you're the best. How much time do you spend over here? Um, I, actually, I have to say last year I didn't spend as much time as I should have. I do like to come in and, and uh, volunteer as librarian, but I had a rough year last year. But hopefully I'll be able to do more this year. So, um, probably at once, or two to three times a month, let me put it that way. That's great. Yeah. If everybody, if we could get 50 people to spend yeah. two or three times a month, we'd yeah. have a real swinging organization. I, I should throw another name out to you because she's not here today, unfortunately, but um, Pat LaBounty also oh. was here helping to, uh, she did a lot of organizing with our journals and whatever. So she put in a lot of time. Well, I yeah. hope we turn the page so that people will be able to look in this book and want to become uh, at least members and maybe serve in, in a more intensive way in the yeah. future with this organization because I believe it has a, a great, great uh, deal to do with teaching us about our family history and I, I hope more people get involved. Well, what, Just like what you, it did Teresa. to me was to get me involved in history. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. Can yes. you imagine at this stage in your life, huh? And in Hungarian history. Yeah, that's even better. Yeah. Thanks so much, Teresa. You're welcome. Have a lovely day. Thank will you? you. See you <laughs> later, you. kiddo. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right, now we have a triumvirate here. <laughs> at least three people besides me. Ron Tedro, how are you? Fine, how are you? Ron? Roland. Roland? Uh, Roland, yes. Roland Tedro, I'm sorry. He told me his name 20 seconds ago, so if we don't do this quick, we've lost it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good to see you. I don't think you and I have met before. Mm, I don't think so, no. Well, how, do you, how are you involved with this group? I've been working for a part of the time I've been with them as a copy editor for the books that they published. Oh, publish. boy. And, uh, but I'm out of that now. What does a copy me? editor do? Goes through, tries to format the books and go through and see that the spelling of the names are the same as they should be. That gives in me the a headache books. just thinking about it. <laughs> it it's a, takes a long time. 
But you're, are you a member of the board now? Yes. Good group. What a sturdy group we have here today. Isn't we have it? a wonderful group. We so really what, were you involved in the, in the move over here? Not much, no. My heart wouldn't let me do much in the line of moving. Hey, as long as you can sit here and chat with me for five minutes, what happens <laughs> after that? You're on your own, you know. Packing? Packing's good. Yeah, packing's good. Yeah, the, it's, it's, uh, we've made the process sound a lot easier than it really was in, in getting a place like this moved, but isn't it nice? To be in a venue like this. Yes, it is. Much nicer than the other place. Now, are you originally from this area? Yes, my family's from Merrill. Maryland? Merrill. Well, that, the other I, side of line from Merrill. Merrill. That makes even more sense, doesn't it? It's no kidding. And you grew up there? Yes. And then did, do you live now in Keysville? or? No, I live in Dannemora. I was just, somebody was just telling me a good ghost story. From an old white house somewhere. I gotta find out where it is in Denimara. There must be All I know is the Leclairs live there now, so I've got to track that down first. But it's a great, it's a great town. We've done several television shows in Denimara, the history of the prison, and so on. Well, it's great to have you here today, and I personally thank you for your contribution to this group. Well, thank you. It's a lot of hard work, but boy, it's so satisfying when it's done. Yes, it's very satisfying. And next to you, my dear friend, Ron and Carol Allen, how are you? Fine, thank you. Nice, well, thank to, you. nice to be with young people. Good oh. to be here, Gordy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saying Thanks. that. And evolved so much with the history of Peru. Every one of our little towns and hamlets and, and nooks and crannies has a rich history. Peru has one of the best, doesn't it, Ronnie? It does. It really does. Yep. It goes yeah. it goes back, and my heart is in both places, really, both Peru and Keysville. My uh, my father has roots here in Keysville, and my mother's family was from Peru. So I I'm, did I'm sort not of know divided. that. You're covering the waterfront yeah, here. Absolutely. The whole... absolutely. Yeah. And You're I and I grew up here in Keysville. Of course, of course I've lived did. in Peru longer than Keysville now. So <laughs> my heart's in both places, too. You know, I never asked you this the most embarrassing question. How did you guys meet? We were high school sweethearts. Come on. Right? Yeah. I didn't think there were ever any high school sweethearts left well, in this crazy <laughs> world we live in. Were you really? Yeah. Where, in what school? I, I, I went to Peru and, and Carol went to Keysville. But we, uh, I, I, had just, I, I had just gotten my, just, just gotten my driver's license, and uh, I was with a friend. Uh, we went into a, a place here on, on, on Keysville, on, on Front Street in Keysville, it's called Jimmy's, I believe, it's the old bus stop, but they sold, uh, <laughs> they sold soft drinks and sodas and magazines and so on, and we were just, we just stopped in there for a soda, and Carol get me. Didn't know her, but well, she had long hair, and I was just really taken, taken by her. And I said, "Wow, who is that?" And fortunately, my friend uh, Jim Boyd uh, knew her name. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, there was a dance at Peru, and, and Carol was there, and uh, had to go ask her to dance. Of course. And she refused. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Playing hard to get. <laughs> right. I knew dance. this would be a good story. <laughs> but uh, several, ah. several boys asked her to dance, and she refused all of them. I was the only one stubborn enough to go back and, and ask her a second time. <laughs> and she, uh, she accepted the second, second time. So here we are. We, we've well, been together seven years later. Since. <laughs> like my wife said, you chased her till she caught you. Absolutely. <laughs> Isn't that? And here we are after all this time. You are such charming and wonderful people, but you've all both, unlike Teresa, you both were always interested in history, weren't you? I, I've always been interested in local history, yes, and then got into family and. Family history, of course, you can't separate the two. Not a, they, certainly they, they not go, here or anywhere else where go, you start to think hand, about it. They go hand in hand. But why? Why do you, did you people choose to actually? Now, are you, are you the official historian? Are you a? We we are both. We are both co-historians co in the town of Peru. Oh, isn't that cool? And but, both, and but how did that transpire? How did you become the historian? I knew you long before that. Peru never really had a, a historian's office. We, we, we had 
several town historians, but never a place to, to gather documents and maps and photographs. And uh, I, I felt strongly that uh, th there was a lot of history out there in attics and in basements and garages. And I, I, was always, uh, I always felt that if there was a central location that people would come forth with these things. And fortunately, there was a little closet and downstairs in the town hall. I remember hall we were there. Remember, with our, <laughs> that's a, a long time closet. ago. But uh, it was enough. It was a beginning, and uh, we soon filled that small space very, very quickly. Um, so we took down a petition and, and doubled our space. But again, we <laughs> we filled that space as well. There's still a lot of history out there in attics and garages and, and we're kind and of basements. overflowing into these other stories, Jerry, that we're kind of like gradually taking over. <laughs> oh, are you really? <laughs> like, yeah. like a growing yeah. like an amoeba that's growing <laughs> and reaching its tentacles into the <laughs> But but it's so exciting every time someone brings something into the office to donate. It's uh, all, the, all the wonderful old pictures. I really love the pictures that people bring in, you know. But, uh, um, of the town years ago and families and so on and they've shared family histories with us which we've enjoyed having and keep and people can come in and look at them if they want to look at what we have. So many, yeah. so much religious history in Peru in all these towns oh. but there you know with the, with the Quakers and the, mm -hmm. you know the whole, the whole uh, all the, you know the French from over here and the English from over here and it's interesting you mentioned the Quakers because soon after we opened the, the historian's office in Peru, uh, the Stafford family, uh, of course, they, they had roots going back to the Quakers. Oh, yes. They had a, a lot of information, a lot of documents, and they that was really our first big donation. Was it really? The Stafford oh, family. yes, it's good to mention was, their names. That was, that was our beginning, and we, we've grown substantially from that time, but they, they were the, the nucleus of and their families touch so many other families in Peru. It's just, of course, I think any community, it's amazing. You, you can go any place and you're going to find someone who's, you mentioned a name, like you just mentioned Dajna here, and you have a, a relative who's well, Dajna. Of course, my brother-in-law does and, Dajna. Uh, and Don does, and I think I do, only mine is spelled this funny way that I can't pronounce. <laughs> well, Don, Don has talked about that quite often. Yeah. Matter of fact, the first ghost story I ever wrote was about Don Dajna's father. Really? Who lived and had a restaurant and a store across the street from our house. So everything oh, is wow. connected. Yep. The towns are connected. Why is it important for you people as, as historians in Peru to have a resource like this? Well, it's extremely important that, that people have a place that they can come to do research. Uh, so many times, as been mentioned before by Anastasia and Gloria, they, they may be curious, they may have questions, but they really don't know where to go to, to get answers to these questions. And, and here we have it. This is probably the, one of the nicest and largest collections in this whole area up here. I, I can't even think of another uh, collection anywhere close to this, uh, with all the uh, church records from Canada and locally. and. Uh, you know, we have um, uh, the census records, we have uh, this whole Palantine collection over here, which is really wonderful Amazing. for the German Amazing. people that came up here. Uh, it's just wonderful. Um, it's just a wonderful resource. It's a good resource in that it's a, a lot of people don't know how to start researching their I was just going to say that, yeah. And so you open here, you go on the internet and... Gives you a starting point. Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's so many people that have been here so long doing this, like Gloria and, and Teresa, that can help other people uh, when they come in. They can will point, do it willingly, point them enthusiastically. In the you know, and, and they can point them in the right direction as far as where they might want to start looking, or uh, it's just... Uh, well, she told me what the, what the membership dues are. They're mm -hmm. very modest. They you can come in here and spend, spend a day and spend five bucks, you said? Five bucks. Yeah, and if you and go, if you're go online and, and see what some of the websites will charge you yeah. for an if, hour. If you're a member, what you some can, of the universities will charge you to get into their archives for three days or one day. Or, yeah. And if you're a member, you can come in as many times as you want to when we're open with no charge. Bring, bring your bag lunch, right? Yeah, that membership gives you you know access. 
all the time we're open. Have you people been involved since the beginning? No, I, I've forgotten when we did. It's been many years. It's been many, many years. years but but, uh, we, we were just members initially and then became members of the board and volunteer librarians. So it, it's been many, many years. I'm not sure myself. Uh, well, for all the reasons we've mentioned and many, many more, this Northern New York American Canadian Genealogical Society is an integral fabric part of the fabric of this whole North Country and is becoming more enmeshed in that whole fabric from every point of view every day. Mm -hmm. And if a person, as Gloria said, if a person didn't find what they were looking for in 2004, for goodness sake, come back. Mm -hmm. Chances are you have it now. Oh yes, we're always, we're always growing and collecting it, seeing some more information all the time. So it's, it, it's a wonderful resource, and the people who work here and on these shelves all around us are, are little doors that open to other resources that are available here, both here and elsewhere. We're fortunate in many respects here in the <coughs> North Country to have this genealogical society, to have the Feinberg Special Collections mm -hmm. yes. at, at our uh, SUNY Plattsburgh, to have town historians that really, really care. And it wasn't always that the historian's office was involved in genealogy. You know, when I was a kid, the historian, whoever it would be, it was some guy who was born there 87 years ago, who cut, who cut clippings out of the newspaper every day and pasted them. <laughs> that's what historians did. Yeah. That's, that's how they chronicled history by keeping the newspapers. Mm -hmm. But it's gone far beyond that. I think there was a feeling many years ago with most historians that the history was, you know, just the history of, you know, the, the, the locale and so on, what was going on there. But you can't separate the people from the history. Of course you, you really can. can't. Uh, they're an integral part of it. And, uh, the reasons that they came there is definitely part of history, but you know what? You know the people that came. I think that makes it exciting. The people that came and why they came. Well, what uh, have you got a goal for 2011 or 2012? We're we're uh, involved in in a, an era in our nation's history that is so exciting. We uh, the world history we can't keep up with because we don't know if the world's going to be here tomorrow or next Wednesday morning, but are, are you, have you got some special goals for the next little while, some little project you're working on that you'd like to crack? Well, one, one of the ones in the town of Peru, uh, a goal that we've had for quite some time, and it's nearing, it's nearing the end, uh, is getting the, the Hayworth Mason building, the old, the old stone building that was part of uh, the A. Mason Lumber Complex for so many years, uh, getting that building on the National Register. Uh, it's been a long process. Uh, we just received notification last month that it has passed all, it's been accepted on the state level. And now it's being passed on to the national level. And uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed, but usually, usually the biggest hurdle is the state. If it passes that, uh, it it's usually is accepted on the national level as well. So well, that's got to happen so, for that building. I so, mean, how, how many people have memories of their fathers and uncles and grandfathers who worked there, right? Yeah, right. That was one of those oh, postcards was, I was telling you about, a, a picture of the front of that place that's instantly recognized yeah. by anybody who's lived around there for very long. Yeah. A. Mason and Sons Lumber Company was the heart and soul of Peru for almost 100 years. That was the main employer. Uh, a second goal that we have, we, we were just... Uh, we were just given a, 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 a one-room schoolhouse, the, the Lions the Oh, Lions here we Street go again. Yeah, I love so, <laughs> one-room schoolhouses. So, uh, we, we feel very fortunate to, to have that building. Uh, it was donated uh, just recently, and we hope to put that building on the National Register as well. So have you got to move it? Second, no, no, it's staying, it's stay staying there. exactly where it is. That's, these one-room schoolhouses have a tendency to move from place to place. <laughs> Sometimes, as it happens in the northern tier, they even come back close to home. <laughs> they got one in Merrill. I went to school there. Did you? No kidding. Yes. For a while, long time, or mm, from the time I was about uh, maybe three and a half until seven. 
They sent you to school when you were three and a half? Well, you were a precocious kind of little bugger even story. back then? My cousin was the teacher. Oh, there we go. And she had a daughter <laughs> who was the same age as I was. Of course. So she'd bring the little girl to school with her rather than leave her home with dad. And she, on the way to school, she'd stop and pick me up to play with her. <laughs> so I started school about three and a half. Is it that? A, that's what I, everybody's got so much, <laughs> so many neat stories. And now we're reading these special letters to the editor and speak outs in our newspapers. And why did we ever centralize schools in the first place? We had our little neighborhood schools. That's all we ever needed. I've often wondered that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, to show you how old I am compared to everybody else within 50 miles of this place, uh, schools weren't centralized when I went to school, even through high school. Every school I ever attended is gone. The bricks don't even exist anymore. Well, my little one-room schoolhouse still exists. It's on the hill, yeah, overlooking the lake. View. <laughs> oh, you know where it is? Oh, even. yeah, I've been there. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> beautiful. My, my mother went to school there. Isn't that wonderful? She had the same teacher I did. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Is that possible? Yes. Yes. We, I think the, we ought to stay here. I think we ought to plant some spaghetti for something here. Remember back in those days, a, te a teacher had to have eighth grade. Yeah. And what was it? I think it might have been, it was either six weeks or six months of normal school. That's all. They went to the normal school right here in Plattsburgh. That's right. And then that became they Plattsburgh school. State Teachers College. That and became, became, became. Here's these teachers that were going to school and teaching. And some of the students in their one room school were five, six, eight, ten years older than they were. Isn't that wonderful? I've got a school bell at home. I have one, one of the too. handheld I have one too. wooden handle, brass. <laughs> My wife's mother, Leona Vaughn, went to the normal school and taught, taught in a one-room schoolhouse around here way back when. And I'm sure Anastasia knows that our dear friend and mentor, the late Addie Shields, taught at what is now called Hawkins Hall. Oh, I didn't know that. In the campus school <coughs> in 1938. And she's smiling down on us right right now. Is that cool? Yes, it is. One room school houses. Don't get me started. I love it. <laughs> Did you guys go to small schools? No. I, I uh, started, in, started in the centralized school in Peru. I'm, coincidentally, uh, Peru Central School was centralized in 1938. And that's the year oh, I was, it was. born. No that, kidding. That's the year I was born. So it's an easy, easy I knew you were younger. <laughs> yeah, I knew you were younger than I was. Yeah. <laughs> so, no kidding. The centralization went, took place over a long period of time. Right. Mine wasn't centralized till I, about the mid fifties. I don't think Mo I were brushed it. But so, even, uh, even at that, we still had smaller, you know, smaller classes oh. than they have today. I mean, I think there were like 35 in my class, and I think maybe it's about the same in yours, whereas most of the classes now are, I'm sure, in the hundreds. Hundreds or thousands. Yeah. I had between 9 and 11. There are a couple of people who don't want to admit they graduated with me, so. <laughs> <laughs> but we do get together every year somewhere down around Malone, Moira, Brushton. Great memories, huh? And we do yes. remember, we talk about our teachers and so on, and they're the ones who, who got us interested in history, even though they didn't manage to, to turn Teresa's crank when she was in high school. I, my, those teachers, we owe so much for sitting us in, and you've got to know this, Gordy, you need to know this. And they did. You got the advantage in a small school of listening to everybody else's classes. Well, the the, be, the biggest advantage of going to a one-room schoolhouse was that the teacher had was teaching pre-kindergarten. There was no kindergarten pre-first grade. Three and a half, four-year-old kids. As soon as soon as they were toilet trained, off to school they went. See, I didn't know that till today. And. Um, up I'm not sure I was taught, toilet trained until I was a teenager. She I'm taught in <laughs> seventh grade there. Yeah. She had maybe, and I'm going to guess here because it's a long time ago, maybe 40, 45 students. But the older students, the ones in higher in the higher grades, 
while she was teaching this group would be teaching the younger students, would be helping. And you learn more from teaching than you do from being taught. Isn't that what, that's wonderful. You just said the magic words as Groucho Marx. You say the magic word and the duck comes down. Absolutely true. And I almost owned a recitation bench, which there was <laughs> in the front of every one of those one-room schoolhouses. My mother ended up with one at the edge of her garden later in life, and I wanted it, but it was so badly deteriorated by then I didn't get to keep it. Because we all have memories of when it was time, right? You went up and sat on the recitation bench. <laughs> there is a one-room schoolhouse in Salmon River on Route 22. That is now a home on the right-hand side. Some friends of mine who worked for New York State Electric and Gas bought the place, and he, she sent him out looking for a school desk because she wasn't, didn't want to live in an old schoolhouse if it didn't have a school desk. <laughs> so he scrounged the North Country and came back a couple days later, I'm sure, with those scroungy old desks, but beautiful, the wrought iron with the... And she called me up on the phone and said, you aren't going to believe it, I was just cleaning the top of this old desk and some kid had written his name there with a compass, and just then I had pangs of conscience. <laughs> I was in third grade, I remember taking my compass and writing Gordon Little and trying to hide it with my book. And that desk, the school's been gone for 60 years, but the desk ended up two miles from my house. <laughs> Memories. Quite frequently, uh, all, some of those old school desks turn up at Bridge Street Auction Service. I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Maybe that's where he got it. I don't know what dump it had been in for <laughs> all those years. But Quite frequently, Steve gets okay. one or two desks in yeah. with the wrought iron work. Mm -hmm. You know, while we have an opportunity as we sit here, um, I want to mention again that uh, Museum Day is June 4th. There will be an open house at this facility, mm -hmm. free beer and pretzels for everybody. <laughs> but the, it is free to get in that day. It will be free to get in that day. Who's bringing the beer? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, ver it's very important to do that. And, and something else is very important, and that is to direct people to the website. It's, it's fairly easy to find, even for the fat fingers like mine. I had to get a new keyboard recently because my thumb went right through the space bar. And that's pretty hard to do when you have a magnesium or whatever. But anyway, the Northern New York American Canadian Genealogical Society, if you just type that in, you will you get to the website? You don't even have just, to type that in. Just, just N-N-Y-A-C-G-S. Just the initials. We'll get you in. Just the initials. We'll do it. N-N-Y-A-C-G-S. <coughs> you don't even dot, need dot com or anything. It's amazing. And search. Huh? Remember back in the old days if you didn't have the right case and you didn't have the... Mm -hmm. So you don't even need .com or .org or anything. It'll take you right there. Right. And it's a, as I mentioned at the outset, it's a wonderful resource. Oh, it is. There are so many links tied to it. It's a great site. It's Fantastic just site. amazing and wonderful. And every day, <laughs> in spite of my advanced age, I learned more about the history of this area. And there's any number of family trees that are included in there, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And hundreds. They, <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds. Yeah. These Julie. people have found more out about Calvin than he even <laughs> wanted to know. He's married to his own cousin, I found out. Six times removed. Yeah, and Meyer and both his <clears throat> brother Andre. Yeah, we, we have common ancestors way back somewhere. Julie Dobb has done a fantastic job with that site. You she, know, did, she did an excellent job a couple of years ago with the, the uh, Champlain's. Walk with uh, Champlain. Walk oh my with Champlain. goodness. Wasn't that exciting? And, and she's doing a similar project uh, this year with the Civil War descendants. So she does and that's coming up because this is the 150th job. anniversary and that commemoration will be going on for four years. And I'm so glad you mentioned Julie's name. She's just a sweet and wonderful woman who is, like everybody else in this room, absolutely, completely, 100% dedicated to this organization and what it does. We've interviewed Julie as a, at least twice, right? Oh, several times. Or three or four, I mean, interviewed her many times, but full-length programs at this society and the other 
location several times. And it's just amazing. Out of the goodness of her heart to call me up and tell me about my ancestor's book that was written that all these professional people have been trying to research the family and never knew this old dude would probably roll over in his grave if he knew that we got a copy of that book. But isn't it, it's, it's like I said, it's um, genealogical archaeology, right? You're di using that spade in a manner of speaking and turning over new things and discovering new things. And I know you, you people appreciate that too when it happens for you or for somebody who comes oh, into your office. Definitely, yeah. It's, uh, you got a nice feeling when you feel you've uh, helped somebody to find something out they didn't know about their own family. Yeah, that's great. It's a really nice feeling. I, I thank you so much for coming over here today. I had no idea I was going to see you or I would have brought the goodies that I have with your name on them for the last six months sitting on, mm -hmm. on my... My wife tries to move things around the kitchen saying, Gordy, what's this stack? I mean, mine, i got to take that today. I'm doing a show with Calvin. Okay, what are these pictures for? Oh, that's for Ron and Carol. Maybe I'll see them sometime. <laughs> Thank you. Gordy. Story of my life. Thanks so much, all Thank of you, you for Thank what you. you do. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. You know the old phrase, what goes around comes around? Mm -hmm. We're back to the beginning yes, with Anastasia are. and their mommy, Gloria Pratt. <laughs> This has been fun. I know you've participated, but you've also been a very enthusiastic audience back there. Yes, you indeed. giggled in the appropriate places and so on. Let's talk a little bit about, as we end this program, about the very beginnings of this organization. Yes, Bill Marquis is the one who started it all. And again, you know, we can never thank him enough. And we had a lot of people, and I know I'm going to forget a lot of names, and I hope I don't. Just a little while ago, we lost one of our members, Grace Lucia, oh, yes. who was our, uh, our librarian and dedicated a lot of time here with her work, you know, for the library. Uh, we also had um, Ellie Martinson and her husband, Len. Mm -hmm. We had Marie and Leanne Gannett. And Marie and Leanne, now that we have a ramp, they will be coming back again. Mm -hmm. Betty Botton has done an awful lot of work with the society and again with the ramp we'll be getting a lot of these people back now and so hopefully on saturday we'll get our ramp back and a lot of people will be able to start coming again uh bernadette potry did i mention her and her son joseph were another um beginning the uh, from the very beginning um i believe uh sylvia burgess was one uh, I know I'm going to forget a lot of them, but they know these, who they are. That's right, and these people have done so much for this organization, and um, well, and and one of our longtime librarians just before Julie was um, Bobby Sagan, who also did a lot. And I think it's important just to know that that many people went into creating this organization and and keeping it going over the many years, and we genuinely invite anyone who's interested to come and join that that family to make this library move further into the future and increase our, our presence and increase our holdings and help just more generations of people interested in their family trees definitely well said that's great it's wonderful she said it all thanks to all the people who formed the building blocks like building this cement block building had to start with the first block somebody who laid the cornerstone and you've mentioned all of those names and as always, because I'm very forgetful, uh, if we did leave out a few names, we apologize yeah. profusely. But that, that'll give you a chance to catch up with them, because they'll call you and chew you That's out. Right. On that. <laughs> Bobby Sagan was our president for a lot of years, and her daughter helped put all these bookcases together when we first got them, and uh, did an awful lot of work mm -hmm. to the, help out. The, the shelves are hardly sagging at all after they're, all They're the, very nice. That's right. You'd Barb is the one who went out and bought these at the time. She was the president, and she went out and found them and knew what we had to have, and so therefore did a lot of work. Again, we're at 15 Vine Street in Keysville, a place yeah, right. that's relatively easy to find. You can almost follow your nose. <laughs> and we do have a number out there now. We didn't before, but starting Saturday.
We have numbers. The numbers are there now, um, and we'll have a sign along with a ramp. And we welcome everyone, 15 Vine Street in Keysville. But we also welcome you to visit us online at nnyacgs.com. Whoa, she did it right. <laughs> from memory, from the yes. top of her head. Gloria, Anastasia, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the choir members who are here today. We've been preaching to the choir all day, That's and right. hopefully a few people out there in the congregation have listened and will find your website. I hope so. We'll scrape up the money to become members, and maybe that once they get involved, as everybody here has, get that foot in the door. Exactly. They'll want to be one of those bricks That's right. that builds onto this building in the future. Even though this program may air many times after June 4th, 2011, that's a critical day, right, Anastasia? It is. That's the big open house day, so you're welcome to come. No charge to get in. Just come and see what we have and meet some people and, and see what you can do. See what you can do. That's what life is all about. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for our viewers. Thanks for your comments and your suggestions. Thank you also for your generous checks to Hometown Cable and Calvin Castine on the Ridge Road in Champlain to help these programs continue far into the future. And who knows where we're going to be next time.